Wonderful. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It's really wonderful to see such a, a, a big turnout for something I know that we all care deeply about. I'm Becca Ballant. I am the senator from Wyndham County. I serve on Economic Development and Housing and also the Finance Committee, and I chair this work group. In a moment, I'm going to go around the table and have everybody introduce themselves so that you know who's representing which constituency on this group. So if we could start over here with Karen. I'm Karen Horn, and I represent the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. I'm Lauren Glendavidian. I am the Executive Director of CCTV Center for Media and Democracy, and I'm here on behalf of Vermont Access Network, the 25 access centers that serve us across the state. Good morning, I'm Dan Glanville with Comcast. Uh, I'm employed by Comcast, but I am the industry representative on the group. Uh, good morning, I'm uh, Representative Mike Antrochka. I represent Charlotte, and I'm on the Energy and Technology Committee and uh, Vice Chair of this committee. I'm Clay Purvis. I represent the Department of Public Service. I'm Kyle Landis Marinello. I'm General Counsel at the Public Utility mm -hmm. Commission. Good morning. So for those of you who are not here to testify and are just um, happen to be in the State House today and popped in to see what we're doing, which happens all the time here in Montpelier, this is the PEG Access uh, Study Committee. And we are um, here because of a section in um, Act 79, which was the broadband bill. And we're here to try to figure out going forward how to make sure that PEG Access TV in Vermont remains uh, financially viable. So this is part of our charge, is having a public hearing today, though each of our previous committee meetings has been open to the public and the committee meeting immediately following this hearing will also be open to the public. So you can um, check out all of the previous testimony by checking out the um, film that's been taken by Orca TV and I think distributed to, to other access channels around the state. So if you have not yet signed up to testify today, it's important to get your name on this list and see our committee assistant, Peggy, who's over here by the computer. So we're going to limit testimony, since we do have um, a big crew today, we're going to limit testimony to five minutes. And although I often like to be gentle with people. I'm going to be pretty firm about five minutes because it's really unfair when you have a public hearing and everyone on the front end gets to say everything they want to say and the folks at the end get the shaft. So we're not doing that today. Keeping it to five minutes and of course if you don't need all five minutes that's helpful to the folks coming after you. So first up I have um, Steve Pappas from Plainfield, if you'll come up here. We are on the record, it's being recorded, both filmed and recorded for um, our records here at the State House. So if you could start by stating your name for the record, and if you represent a constituency other than just a citizen, just please let us know. And welcome. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name's Stephen Pappas. I am the executive editor of the Times Argus and Rutland Herald newspapers. Um, for the last seven years, I have been an advocate for PEG access, not just because of the role that it plays in providing a voice to our communities, but rather how it has become one of the most important defenses of our democracy. Like newspapers, PEG stations need unique local content to make it indispensable to its audience. And like newspapers, station directors are coming up with innovative ways to generate streams of revenue, which is why we're here venturing well outside that comfort zone of the existing business model. Like newspapers, if PEG access does not pivot and adapt, uh, the end could be in sight. But I'm hopeful, in fact, I have spoken before state, regional, and national groups explaining how community journalism and PEG access are powerful allies when it comes to value, credibility, and sustainability. And I believe so strongly, in fact, that I have served on the board of directors of CBTV in Barry for a few years as its chair, helping to negotiate that station's certificate of public good and the contract for charter communications. Um, I have had my own public affairs show for three years, taping some 90 episodes and interviewing state leaders and Vermont celebrities. 
I have testified to the FCC and Congress about public access, regularly lobbying our delegation. And through my newspaper, we have created a series called Into the Issues that partners with public access to bring in experts on key issues of the day, most recently taking up homelessness and the opioid crisis and more. I see PEG as a tool and a resource. You can't get any more local than public access. Very few of us are willing to sit through long public meetings for hearings, although I do pay people to do that. <laughs> um, yet PEG stations provide thousands of hours of gavel to gavel coverage that chronicle just how decisions are being made, and my reporters even reach out to the local PEG stations to get copies of meetings they missed or to review sections of meetings that got out of hand or were confusing. And that's what is unique, that that access is available to every Vermonter. In editorials, I often point out to the point of themes of community building, civic engagement, or seeking other perspectives in order to better understand our friends and neighbors in these challenging times. PEG provides it, probably in better ways than my very own newspapers. Through its hours of unique content and hand-picked programming, it shows us intimately what community looks like and what our democracy looks like. That lens brings us together like no other today. So I don't think anyone would disagree we need that right now. In my editorial this weekend, which appeared in both newspapers, I wrote, quote, localism hinges on involvement. PEG provides a medium for our responsibility and accountability. At a local level, what could be more important than gathering the pieces and parts of our community and serving as stewards for its protection and preservation? Thank you. Thank you so much. Before you um, get out of the witness chair, we do have um, a little bit of time. If you don't use the balance of the time, I just want to see if anyone on the panel had questions for you. Can you say how CBTV is diversifying its revenue? Um, they're working in different ways to, I'm not on the board anymore, so I stepped off the board, but it's my understanding that uh, the board there and its executive director have been seeking uh, sponsorship from uh, other groups within the community, doing partnerships with other folks in the community, um, charging small amounts for um, access to the, to do production, to use equipment, things of that nature. Um, but mostly it's um, an aggressive push towards sponsorship, long-term long sponsorship, um, much akin to you know, what, what other public television stations have been doing over time. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Thank you for making the trip. That wasn't that far. I know. I, <laughs> I was, was being a little ironic. Um, next up, uh, Cor Cobridge from down my way, Brattleboro. Thank you for making the trip. Were you in the fog like I was this morning? Totally oh, in the fog. Totally in the fog. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm going to get this under five minutes by speaking fast, so apologies if you have to slow down the tape later to understand what I'm saying. <laughs> um, my name is Cora Trowbridge. I'm executive director of Brown Road Community Television, and I have the, which has the distinction of being Vermont's first public access station established in 1975. I want to thank members of this committee for your work looking for new funding sources in the face of a shifting telecommunications landscape and the need to ensure a stable funding source for the future of PEG in Vermont. As you've learned, cable fees, the primary source of funding for community TV stations, have declined and are anticipated to decline further. I'm here today to tell you what our station has done to diversify revenues and to what extent those revenues can offset the decline. BCTV is a relatively small Vermont station with a budget of around $300,000 serving eight towns. We have four full-time employees and seven part-time field staff. Between the staff and our 50 volunteer producers, BCTV annually produces an average of 1,200 original local programs with the same number of programming hours aired on our two channels. Uh, this volume of programming is equivalent to the output of much larger stations, which speaks to our efficiency. A testament to the quality of our programming is having received national awards for overall excellence three times over the past four years. In an area of the state that has no commercial television, the public good that BCTV provides is without question. We are the only source of content for viewers and the only way for residents to air their views on cable. To provide these services, BCTV depends on Comcast cable fees for approximately 75% of our budgeted income. 
Two years ago, we absorbed an 8% or $20,000 decline after Comcast adopted a gap accounting change. On learning of the FCC rulemaking last fall and the further threat that it poses, BCTV's board of directors looked for changes that we could make to increase other revenues. Diversification of revenues is nothing new to BCTV. We started years ago in order to be able to grow our level of service to the community and it's generated as much as 16% of our income. As an example of how one station is trying to meet this funding challenge, here are the changes that we've made and the hope for impact on future budgets. Municipal fees. In the past, our agreement with towns was that they would receive coverage of regular select board meetings and town meeting day without charge. For the first time, I asked each of our towns for a modest level of support based on the number of residents. The increase we're anticipating is uh, $15,000 from that change. Another change was to our membership fee structure. In the past, members paid $20 annual dues, though at least 50% paid $10 as seniors for unlimited use of our equipment, facilities, and support. Our new fee structure asks members to contribute according to their frequency of use and by the value of what they use. So for instance, a community member who wants to do a weekly studio show will pay more than someone who wants to check out a camera a few times. The increase we're anticipating is $3,000, going from about $1,000 to $4,000. Donations and underwriting. In the past, it was a benefit to our economically strapped region that BCTV did not compete for the limited fundraising dollars with hundreds of nonprofits seeking support from a small number of individuals and businesses. Now we are not only competing for those dollars, but the time that we're going to take to fundraise will reduce our time providing services. The increase we're hoping for is $10,000 from about $7,000 to seventeen. dollars Production services. Like underwriting, this is an activity we've been engaged in for years. We restrict our production work to public access projects so it's not a separate business. While cable revenues have subsidized this work and made it possible to charge an affordable rate to nonprofits, we've increased these rates to cover more of the costs. The increase we're anticipating is 5,000, going from about 35 to 40,000. Even if our goals are met and income from other sources increases by $33,000, it will only increase the contribution of these sources from 16 to 21% of our budget. While we can grow other income slowly over time, there is no scenario in which we can serve the public as we do now without a stable, ongoing, and legislated source of support. The purpose of my testimony has been to demonstrate that our organization is doing everything possible to diversify our income streams. We are looking to this committee to identify legislative revenue sources to offset the decline so that we can keep providing our critical public access services to residents of Brattleboro and Wyndham County. Thank you again for your work on this important issue. Core, 30 seconds to spare. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Any quick questions? True professional with experience. Yes, indeed. <laughs> do, do you have that in, in writing? Yeah. Um, those numbers, you have yes. especially? Submit uh, electronically to, to Peggy over here, and if you need to connect, I've get got, the address. Uh, Mike's email address. Yeah. Yes, so wonderful. That will work too. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so more. much. Uh, next on my list is Matt Kelly from if Burlington. Anybody wants me to read their testimony really fast? Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> my name is uh, Matt Kelly. I'm an independent producer from Burlington, Vermont. Full disclosure, my local public access invites me to host their uh, election night coverage. Okay. And I'm very grateful for it because it allows me to be part of civil and civic discourse. I'm going to show you right now a 30 second public service announcement that I had an idea to create after I learned that the state of Vermont is doing early voting. Figuring that if I didn't know it, other people would not know it and this public service announcement would be helpful. Have you voted yet? Have you voted yet? Have you voted yet? Early voting is already you put the microphone down in the state of Vermont. Just pull the microphone down. Put it near there. I'm pretty proud of it. You okay. should be. It brought the governor, the lieutenant governor, their challengers, Randy Brock and Gino Sullivan to the table. A very across the board, uh, non-political uh, uh, initiative to promote early voting. It was produced to broadcast standards. Mm -hmm. I went to every television station in my market. No one aired it. I hope that shocks you as much as it does me, okay? WCAX, 
would not air it. WPTZ did not air it. Fox 44, Channel 22 did not air it. It's an initiative to promote civic participation in our most treasured institution. The only institution that aired it and produced it is our public access stations. Mm -hmm. It went up to Van and hopefully other stations pulled it down. We produced a, lo a local one as well that brought in our, our city councilors. It's a horrific indictment. And so what I want to talk about is that, and thank you for uh, our local public access to do it, and offer three potential solutions for funding. And the first is on a national level. If Citizens United told us anything, money is speech. And let's now embrace Citizens United for what it actually is. The attempt to demonetize public access is a violation of Citizens United. And let's all get behind it and use that now for its intended good to support public access. The second is on a statewide basis. We just removed and got rid of Vermont life. And yet, year after year, we spent hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, on that initiative, often going into the red. Let's now dedicate that money to producing content that supports our public access station through a travel and tourism message, a diversity message, a governor's message, an economic de a development message, whatever the message is that the state wants, we have the largest unwired network that Van has created. Take that money, allow each public access station to download content on a revenue share basis, where each time they air it, they get a revenue share from the state. Come up with the funding formula from that, but that's a statewide uh, initiative to fund it. On a local basis, I approach this to my local public access. Five Cent Freedom Fridays, leverage the uh, refundable deposits. If, we, if 1,500 people in our local community get a bin and put in a dollar in refundables every week, 52 weeks a year, that's $75,000. Start doing the math. So I'm at one minute left. Okay. okay. It's pretty significant. Okay? So federal, state, and local. Okay. I want to thank you all for really your time to address this for our public access, for the thousands of hours of local content that they produce that our local media isn't offering someone like me an opportunity to participate in. Finally, I'll say I'm making a documentary on the downtown mural. A lot of it is being done by B-roll footage from the coverage of our city council meetings that only occurs in our public access stations. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Next up, uh, Michael Billingsley from Plainfield. Thank you. Thank you for um, coming. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I, uh, like many others in this room, uh, Lauren Gwen and many others in this room, have spent a great deal of my life supporting and promoting public access television. Um, in uh, the past 40 years, I was for 20 years the director of the Image Club, which was a pre-access uh, community production facility that over 20, that 20 years trained about 300 independent producers, many of whom jumped on board as soon as Lauren, I, and Sam Press at the Department of Public uh, Service were able through the Public uh, Service Board to um, mandate that funding from cable operations would come to the local producers. And since that time, after leaving Montpelier um, Advisory, Cable Advisory Board, after that was established and later became ORCA, um, went on to direct Amherst Community Television, where Dan and I were more or less sort of nemesis for one another from time to time, and um, then to um, the board of Brattleboro Community Television and stepping off that board after several years to be the interim director before court arrived. And I um, more recently have been, and all that time have been an independent producer, often with funding from the government. Many of these funds came from the government even before access was formally built into the Vermont legislative process. We also were funded by the Vermont Council on the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities. These funds made it possible to train people, bring them into the production community 
and provide them with the tools to do that. My prepared statement is to say this, um, uh, probably covering a lot of familiar ground that you've heard over and over, but I'm going to do it again. Um, public access to uh, television with its uh, public educational and government video production and screening is a linchpin of participatory democracy in the United States. Independent, locally generated content makes this possible. As you know, pay access funding now shrinks along with cable television providers' gross income. This undercuts the financial support for local PEG programming, staff, and production facilities. Loss of such support potentially silences the independent voices of Vermont's community video producers. Who are these community producers? They are people of all ages, backgrounds, and persuasions who volunteer to create public interest programming which ranges from how-to shows, local newscasts and programming, investigative reporting, arts and music, shows with live guests and interviews, event documentation, pol political forums and in-studio performances, all the way to educational collaborations with schools, including in many cases course and workshop presentations, student projects, school sports and performances, school board meetings and parents information, along with college student work and documentation of local politics and town meetings. This is one of the significant ways by which Vermont knows its own people. PEG access is the living pulse of community creativity, history, collective learning, storytelling, and participatory government. Uh, our own neighbors and community leaders are producers of video content. When I worked as a media administrator in Montpelier, Amherst, Massachusetts, and Brattleboro, for example, Two 11-year-olds produced, without any adult involvement, a weekly news magazine about their town. Uh, school children and college students did investigative reporting. Teenagers made prize-winning animations and even feature-length scripted films. Adult producers made documentaries about their communities of color, their countries of origin, and their hobbies, and hosted shows about world music, local artists, and craftspeople recorded initiatives for addressing conservation and climate change, documented outdoor sports, and interviewed community elders. This is how we know ourselves. So Michael, you have one minute left. All right. All of this is, uh, was accomplished via the existing federal mandates that the cable television industry support video production in their client communities, using a portion of the money that they earned in those communities. I appeal to this committee and to the Vermont Legislature to craft a sound support network by which all media content providers, which would include cable, telephone, and internet, to send a portion of their local income back to their client Vermont communities, which generate that income. Peg access has become essential to maintaining a healthy, creative, and informed democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Michael. Next up is another Michael. I'm having a hard time reading the last name. Uh, Michael from Rockingham. It's Smith. Smith, okay. <laughs> I ought to be able to. it funny because it's so common. That's right. So if you'll just wait one moment before you start. Welcome Thank you. from my neck of the woods. All right. Um, well, I'm, my name is Michael Smith. I'm the um, currently the president of the board of directors of Falls Area Community Television. We're the cable access take provider in Bellows Falls. Uh, I've been in, I've been involved for about ten years with PEG, so I'm relatively new compared to everyone else that's been testifying. Um, I've submitted some written testimony. I'm, though I'm comfortable doing it in, in speech, but I'm going to open with just my quote. The threats of freedom of speech, writing, and action are often trivial in isolation, 
but they're cumulative in their effect, and unless checked, lead to a general disrespect for the rights of the citizen. And that's by George Orwell from 1984. Um, I would like to say that Hague Access Television allows people to think their own thoughts and then transmit those thoughts to others. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is the fundamental right of our citizens, and um, it's the fundamental value of Hague Access. Um, I would say that one of my quotes is, uh, everything, not all flowers are roses, and um, not all content on paid television is polished and well done. But I think mm -hmm. that fact brings out the, um, mm -hmm. the value of paid television mm -hmm. in that it is people, it's citizens. They're saying their thoughts and they're, and they're um, speaking their mind. Mm -hmm. And it may not be um, political speech. It may be Grandma Kitty reading to the kids, but it is really valuable. And reducing the amount, or reducing the access to, or reducing the volume of paid television is really reducing speech. And when we reduce speech, we reduce our ability to think. We reduce our ability to form ideas, and we reduce our ability to function as a government. And I think that is the value of um, paid television, and I think it is also uh, the reason I'm here today is that I value that and I'm hoping that we'll come up with some solutions to this problem. Mm -hmm. I've entertained questions. Mm -hmm. um, we are doing, we are currently developing strategies to uh, diversify our income, mainly mm -hmm. going to toward, a, toward a Patreon style model. Um, I'm sorry, say that again. A Patreon, um, I don't know if you know me, people uh, gather they fundraise online by um, offering up content for sponsorship, sort of idea. But it's mo it's Patreon. It's creating patrons of the arts, and um, so some artists are using it now. We're looking at that sort of idea. Um, we are really small. We're about half the size of Brattleboro, mm -hmm. um, and we manage on two full-time employees. We have two channels that we do 24/7 on Comcast and two channels we do 24-7 on Vermont tele Telephone or VTEL. Um, we, with two employees, any cuts in our funding really cut to the bone. It's not like we can just cut, you know, you don't, you almost go out of existence when you cut. Um, so thank you for your time and I'll entertain any questions otherwise. Are you doing any collaboration with other access centers? Do you mean like um, we're part of Van? Right. Um, personally, I don't, but um, I know that we go to the Van meetings and we do things with uh, some of our current, our former staff work at uh, in Brattleboro, and we like collaborating with them. But um, I wouldn't say we have a formal collaboration. I was just wondering if you were considering any shared <coughs> expenses or not at this point. I mean, we're still. One of the things that we're working, one of the, it's we're still in a level of uncertainty. We're not sure what this, what this is, what the impact is going to be. There's not been a real um, a fine line drawn. I don't know how much time I have left. But I'm you have 40 <laughs> seconds left. You're doing great. <laughs> but, and we don't. I mean, just to be completely transparent, we don't either. That is part of yeah, our charge, right? Is to try to get our hands around that. Yeah, that's. Yeah. I guess the uncertainty is is one of the things that makes it difficult for us to come out and say, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but we, you know, we haven't come up with that yet. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank really you. appreciate it. So next up, we have um, Estelle Emmons and Charlie Taylor from Charlotte. Uh, feel free to bring another chair up if you'd like, if you both want to sit together. And are you five minutes each or five minutes together? Um, we, it's fine either way. Just wanted to know. We're just, we're going to do it together. Okay, great. Good morning. My name is Estelle Emmons and I am an eighth grader at Charlotte Central School. My name is Charlie Taylor and I'm also an eighth grader at Charlotte Central School. Have you ever had the opportunity to talk live with an astronaut while they are living and working in space on board the International Space Station? It's a very rare opportunity, but two years ago our entire middle school had a live video conversation with astronaut Drew 
Gustav, and Scott Tingle. And it only was able to happen thanks to the support our school received from RETN, our local community media center. We learned about the International Space Station and how it is used as an orbiting laboratory to help NASA learn how humans might travel to Mars and beyond. We started by researching all the different kinds of experiments that take place during a mission, and then picked one that seemed especially interesting. I picked ADC and microgravity, which stands for antibody drug conjugates. The research is about targeting cancer cells and finding treatment for cancer patients now and in the future. And I picked the cool flames investigation. Cool flames happens when gas is burning at the perfect temperature where there is no flame and the gas burns very sl slowly so that more fuel is used to power the rocket instead of losing fuel from heat. At the video conference, I remember it started with mission control calling out to the ISS. ISS, this is Houston, do you copy? And then Charlotte Central School, this is mission control, do you copy? And from that point on, it was just like we had Scott and Drew with us in the gym. We could see them floating around the ISS. They passed the microphone back and forth. It was sort of like just float right there in front of them. It was crazy to see actual people weightless in space. Many of the kids in our class were able to come up to the microphone and ask the astronauts questions about our experiments, including me. We were trying to find out information that would help us with our final project, which was to create a short video for NASA that would help explain the experiment we were learning about to other middle school students. I asked if they had ever been in any emergency situations. If so, what happened? Thankfully, the answer is no. I remember some of the questions were, what suggestions do you have for someone that wants to be an astronaut and work for NASA? someday. And another was, how does microgravity affect your daily activities like sleeping or rinsing your toothbrush? Everything worked really smoothly during the 30 minute downlink. It was amazing to think that we were really talking to live to two people who were flying around the earth at 17,000 miles per hour. Our gym was packed with students and lots of parents and community members that came, all, came over to be part of this once in a lifetime opportunity. When the downlink was done, our work was just getting was just getting going. Over the next few weeks, Jean Ferreira and Ross Ransom from RETN came over to help us and our teachers learn how to make a great video. I don't think Mr. Miller or Mrs. Gray really had a lot of experience with video, and so they were learning right along with us. We learned about A and B roll footage, about how to write a good script, and they taught us how to use the program We Video on our Chromebooks to pull everything together. One day, RETN came over and set up two filming studios in our library, and we each came down to practice and film the main part of our video. <coughs> then we spent the next week really working on our editing, adding in pictures that explained our experience and editing our soundtrack so everything made sense and was interesting to watch. At the end of two weeks, our class had made more than 20 different videos. We watched each, uh, each other's, and it was very neat to see how much we learned considering that when the, in the beginning, some of us didn't even know what the International Space Station was. That was two years ago, and since then we have used the learning that we picked up from the unit in a bunch of different ways. One example is our personal interest project. During this project, you can pick anything you would like to learn or make. This year I decided to create a short film, and my experience with RETN definitely supported that decision. Thank you for the opportunity to share about our work with our local community and media center. We have read that there are a number of challenges to being able to continue the funding for these centers across the state. And we wanted to share how important we think it is that we and our teachers are able to continue to be able to access their expertise. It truly provided us with an out of this world experience and we know it would not have happened without RITM. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And do you have a teacher with you today? Uh, yes. And you are? I'm Alan Miller. I'm scheduled to speak next. Wonderful. Great. Well done. Really well done. Thank you, Thank you for, for coming. I used to teach eighth grade, so I am just beaming like with every <laughs> bit of fiber in me. So thank you for coming here and sharing your experiences with us. And I'd just like to say that I appreciate your uh, involvement, uh, being from Charlotte myself. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, Alan Miller. So, good morning, I'm Alan Miller, uh, representing Champlain Valley School District, Charlotte Central School, and one of several proud teachers of uh, Charlie and Estelle. So, uh, thanks for the opportunity to have them here. And um, 
My role is I'm the digital learning leader and the instructional coach at Charlotte Central School, which basically means I'm responsible for professional development for teachers and especially helping them integrate technology in meaningful ways working with our students. Um, I just want to say that from the time I've taken on this role three years ago, the partnership with our community media center at RETN has been instrumental. And so that's why I'm here kind of speaking on behalf of that partnership. Um, you just heard from Charlie and Estelle about that Mission to Learn project. And it truly is a highlight of the collaboration we've had with RETN. You know, of course, it's amazing to talk live with astronauts. You know, tough for that not to be a slam dunk event that everybody kind of raves about. But from my perspective, it was the learning that came after the event with students and teachers that made it such a success. And that was a vision that RETN really shared as we worked together for several months, making it all come together. Um, from the beginning, the RETN staff bought fully into the vision that this was not really about the downlink, but about leveraging the event for some great student learning. And to see our sixth graders dive into trying to explain astrogenesis or cellular mutations from space radiation and having the support to make high quality videos to share that learning was truly an example of how both technology integration, 21st century learning, and partnerships like this can really empower great <coughs> learning with kids. Um, I'd also call it a huge success because their sixth grade teacher, Natasha Gray, gained enough confidence through the RETN support that she recreated the project again last year. This time launching the unit with educator astronaut Ricky Arnold through Skype in his office at Johnson Space Center. So professional development like this that builds sustainability when you have that kind of support is a key part of the partnerships and something that we're really hoping continues in the future. I often introduce myself as a recovering school administrator. Um, prior to my role with my current role, I was the principal at Shelburne Community School for seven years and that began in 2010. Um, in that role, I also partnered with RETN and the Community Media Center regularly as they broadcast our school board meetings, as our graduations and other special events. I, I have to say I love getting the email from grandparents or distant family who are able to join us electronically from afar for their loved one's graduation or see their fifth grader play in their first band concert. Um, our school is probably one of the more technologically blessed K-8s in the state. We have money and we have equipment. Yet we certainly didn't have the equipment or the expertise to make these sorts of quality webcasts happen. So fortunately, our community media center has always been willing to loan us equipment and often send their staff to stand right beside our students as our students would broadcast the events. And many times our students got their start with those partnerships. In 2014, when Shelburne School Board decided they wanted to try to undertake a $10 million renovation, uh, we also partnered with RETN to create a video that shared the story of the needs and plans for our community. I'm convinced that it was the video they helped produce that was instrumental in building the consensus. We needed to pass that bond mm -hmm. and create what I proudly can say is probably the best middle school instructional building in the state right now. Across the state, we've been developing our graduation proficiencies as part of Act 77. And I think that every set I've seen includes some element of students will be clear and effective communicators. All too often, I think we fail to think broadly in terms of just what communication skills are essential for 21st century literacy. And I would propose that if a student can't make a concise, compelling audio podcast or video, then in fact they're essentially illiterate in today's world. Nearly as much so as a student who can't write a complete sentence. Digital media is no longer a luxury. It's truly the backbone of 21st century communication. And although my new job title is Digital Learning Leader, I'm woefully experienced in regards to using digital media. I didn't grow up making videos, recording soundtracks, but now I find myself wanting to be sure my students have the skills to do both. So I only need about 30 seconds. I'm good. Fortunately, another element of our community media centers, they not only support special projects, but they offer classes on the weekends, and, and I've been able to take part. These past two weeks, I've been able to introduce my middle schoolers to green screen, stop motion video, all because of classes I've been able to take. We're working together to try to understand 360 video and virtual reality. Again, projects I get to do with partners at RETN. So thank you for giving me the time to share about the impact our community media center RETN has had on our school, our students, and my professional development. Having been an administrator, I truly understand the complexity of funding challenges and appreciate your commitment to trying to keep this great resource available to schools and educators around the state. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And we are out of time, but um, 
Are you going to be able to stick around a little bit after the um, testimony today, or are you heading back to school? Um. <laughs> They're like, we don't want to go back to school. Are you joking? What are you talking about? Okay. All right. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next up, I believe it's David Connor from Montpelier. Well, Charlie and Estelle are a hard act to follow. Yes, indeed. <laughs> but it's actually what I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm Dave Connor. I'm the retired emeritus uh, pastor at the Old Meeting House. I'm up in front of the post office with peace signs every Friday, and um, I represent ORCA because I'm on the board of ORCA. Um, I really want to say, I first want to thank you all, but I want to thank those that spoke for incredibly articulate explanations of why public access is important. I've spent my entire life trying to make uh, the media available to the people that are less have less voice. Uh, while I was director of the Memorial Family Center, we uh, there was there were the uh, state television places where you could have live meetings, talk to people in Brattleboro, talk to legislators, talk to people that are running agencies, and all of a sudden, without any vote at our town meeting or any other vote among the parent-child centers, it stopped. We shut down. And that, to me, was what's what the media can do, is to unite us. And one of the reasons I sort of talked John Block into letting me get on the ORCA board is that I want to have the public access available to the entire citizenry, free speech television. When I was a chaplain at Cornell, there were students that were doing a pirate radio station. And the FCC was trying to find them, you know, locate them and shut them down. Why can't the FCC take all of the frauds that are on the telephones of my own house and go after them? <laughs> they want to go after somebody who wants to talk about real truth through news. And so what I've always wanted to do was have the media be alive, especially for the next generation, for those that are marching about the sixth extinction, worried about the animals, birds, and plants, and life that the planet has. They need to be able to hear themselves and see themselves the way that Charlie and Estelle just spoke about. Mm -hmm. And in a place like Orca, we're thinking about trying to have even more chance for them to make their truth and their understanding, <coughs> their technology and their sense of the future alive for them. And, and actually see themselves doing something that becomes available to the entire community. There's, ever since television, there was this weird thing where people always wanted to see themselves on television. Remember, you'd have people on the street in New York City, and there'd be a TV Many set. politicians still do. And, and, and there they would be, you know. And uh, what did Elijah Cummings say? Uh, the children are the people that, that we send to a future that we will not see. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, public access mm -hmm. is incredibly important for that very reason. But then I'll just say one more thing. Did you see how little you had for this meeting? Tiny print, Monday, October 21, Montpelier underlined, public hearing on PEG Access Television, 10 a.m., 12 noon, room 10, State House, PEG Access Study Committee. This is small print. We'll hold a public hearing on the value of PEG. Uh, access channels and services in the rock community. That doesn't draw them in. That doesn't bring people here. I mean, there was a whole list of other things that were going on on October 21st, and I said, wait a minute, that's the problem we're talking about. How do you make the community aware of what's really important? Mm -hmm. And because, look what I've got. I have the entire ORCA schedule for yesterday. Meetings that I would like to know about, things that I'd like to have been at, and I can't get to, but I could watch it at three in the morning, after I watched Brian Williamson. And that's enough, I've used almost five. <laughs> You've got a full minute left. No, that's all right. Oh, you said no yeah. questions, no questions. Thank you so much, David. Corner. Appreciate that. Elaine Haney, seeing you in another uh, situation here than I usually see you. I'm excited to hear your testimony. Come on up. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, and for exploring sustainable funding options for Vermont's PEG access organizations, 
My name is Elaine Haney. I'm the chair of the Town of Essex Select Board, and the Town of Essex includes the incorporated village of Essex Junction. We are the second largest municipality in Vermont with a combined population of over 21,000 people. I have been the chair of the board of Channel 17 Town Meeting Television for four years and have represented both Essex and Essex Junction on that board for seven years. I'm also an employee of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, but I am not here in that capacity today. Understood. <laughs> we rely heavily on Channel 17 as an essential part of comprehensive community outreach for multiple controversial topics that our residents care deeply about. Live streaming of public meetings conveniently connects people with the select board and the village trustees. But more importantly, our residents are watching our meetings after the fact online multiple times. We are the first community in Vermont, I believe, Lauren Glenn, correct me if I'm wrong, to live stream annual meeting. So we have been trying to innovate and bring our residents more involved into government by using Channel 17 in that way. Videos about our recent firearms discharge ordinance amendments were viewed and shared hundreds of times. The lone reporter who covers our community for our local paper seems to write about almost all of our meetings. I wonder how he does that because he watches all of the meetings mm -hmm. and reports on them that way because he's just one guy. Mm -hmm. Residents refer to planning commission meeting videos to maintain accountability as they watch buildings go up in their neighborhoods and want to ensure that what was agreed to at the PC meeting is actually happening on their street. And Essex Junction and Essex are once again preparing to vote on merger. Channel 17 is a crucial part of educating residents on how merger might impact them. We simply cannot do the business of governing without our PEG access station. The current precarious state of funding for PEG stations statewide concerns municipalities deeply, and we urge the legislature to consider alternative funding models that will sustain and strengthen them. Channel 17's coverage area is comprised of Essex, Essex Junction, Burlington, South Burlington, Williston, Lewiski, and parts of Colchester. Over 200,000 people have access to our services. Each municipality pays annually for meeting coverage. However, the cost of recording, editing, and broadcasting these meetings far exceeds the funding municipalities can provide. The balance currently made up by funding from local cable providers is in jeopardy, and our municipalities will not be able to replace all of it. In the past four years, we have twice asked our member municipalities to double their annual appropriation to Channel 17. I think you will agree that requesting a doubling of appropriations on a regular basis is not a sustainable funding model. We will soon propose a small annual increase that we hope our menu member municipalities will be able to absorb. But the potential gap in funding we face could not be made up unless we asked each municipality to increase their appropriation over 400%. Our member municipalities are willing to cover part of the cost of providing public access to local government, but we are unable to carry the whole burden of the declining revenue. We must identify sustainable sources of revenue that will not only allow peg stations to continue providing Vermonters access to government, but that will also enable them to keep up with changing technology and the challenge of reaching the citizens who depend upon that access wherever they are, whether it's online, on their phones or in front of their TVs. We are encouraged by the legislature's willingness to explore the possibilities of how to sustainably fund the essential service peg stations provide their communities. We support the exploration of revenue alternatives, like allowing municipalities to establish public right-of-way use fees to cover the use of highway and street rights-of-way by providers of telecommunication services. We look forward to uncovering more alternatives as the explorations into potential funding models continue. We urge you to prioritize this discussion so that potential solutions can be developed and implemented before it becomes an emergency. Thank you again for working with us to ensure access to local government for Vermonters by protecting and strengthening our pet stations. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Rader from East Montpelier. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Catherine Rader, past president of the League of Women Voters of Vermont, here to speak for the League. The League of Women Voters' mission is empowering voters defending democracy. 
I want to tell you how the community tele how community television helps the league advance that mission. The league has three primary chapters in Vermont: in Ch Chittenden County, in Central Vermont, and in the Northeast Kingdom, with other members scattered around the state. In Chittenden County, the League of Cham League of Women Voters of Champlain Valley has worked with CCTV to present candidates' forms, including last spring's city council election. They have had public presentations recorded, including one with Secretary of State Jim Condos on election security, and former Representative Tim Little, Tom Little, on redistricting. They've had programs on issues ranging from health care to food deserts, including a call and show on clean water. For the past six years, the Central Vermont League, my home league, has had a variety of programs recorded by ORCA, beginning with a series of in-studio interviews with government officials, state legislators, and professional experts on a wide variety of topics. More recently, the League has hosted an annual spring lecture related in some way to civic engagement, which have been recorded on site by ORCA. For the past three years, the Central Vermont League has partnered with the Kellogg Hubbard Library to prevent a series of four or five programs organized under a common theme. Five programs on the First Amendment, four on political issues under the rubric constitutional crisis, and this year we are presenting five programs on criminal justice in Vermont, covering incarcerated women, prison health care, implicit bias, <coughs> racial bias in enforcement, prosecution, and sentencing, and re-entering the community following incarceration. All of these have been or will be recorded and aired by ORCA. As in past election years, we anticipate holding candidate forums with the help of ORCA next year. Also CCTV and, and uh, Kingdom TV. The League in the Northeast Kingdom often partners with Kingdom Access TV in St. John's Ferry either by requesting that they record and rebroadcast re our public programs like candidate forums or speakers, or that they help produce informational videos which they will then broadcast as part of their programming and which we can also share in a link via email, Facebook, and front porch forum. Just last week, uh, St. Johnsbury members inter interviewed the super super superintendent of school about a proposal bond to improvements, to fund improvements to the St. Jay School Building, an issue which St. John's Ferry's voters will have to vote on early in November so that, the vo so that those voters can know about the facts before they head to the polls. Earlier this year, the Northeast Kingdom League interviewed candidates for select board in advance of town meeting day because they had often heard from voters that it is very difficult to know who to vote for in local elections because of a dearth of information. Last year, they interviewed St. Jay's town clerk on KATV about the nuts and bolts of registering and voting. We hope to create, they hope to create a nonpartisan program on KATV about <coughs> how to judge a candidate to help voters navigate 2020's election cycle. Now, you have one minute left, okay? Excuse me, one minute? You have one minute, yeah. Okay. Uh, that's quite a litany from just one organization that makes use of their public access television stations. The League also recognizes and appreciates the value of the live and reported governmental proceedings provided by our public access stations. While the advent of the internet has complicated local peg stations' legal and financial circumstances, it has taken their services beyond the local. The Vermont Access Network makes programming available statewide, and the League routinely sends links to our programs to our membership, asking them to ask their local stations to air them. The League of Women Voters of Vermont is well aware of the public vote provided by our community access stations and would advocate for public funding to sustain this important service. Thank you so much, and thank you also thank you. for your service uh, with the League of Women Voters. I don't know, did you see the article in the New York Times the other day? There was a woman in the League of um, Women Voters who discovered that after all of her work getting people registered to vote, that her own name had been oh, removed yes, from the yes, rolls. Yes, and 
in yeah. Ohio, exactly. Yeah. And she and a whole cadre of volunteers are, are very carefully going through systematically putting people back on the roll. Ohio so, was, is one of the states yes. so all those problems. And we here are so lucky. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Jerome Lapani from Adamus? Yes. Yes. That's me. I'm looking in the wrong, wrong place. Who's going to film you? Now what's going to happen? That's right. <laughs> this is a turnaround moment. <laughs> I'm stepping from behind the camera where I usually uh, have the role of being a witness yeah. to these meetings, mm -hmm. which I find to be actually quite a wonderful occupation uh, because the role of witness um, is usually uh, absented from our society. Uh, there, are, there are many reasons why I enjoyed being a cameraman um, at Orca. Um, and it has to do, perhaps, with the history of my own activism. In the 1960s, when we were attempting to stop the Vietnam War, and when the environmental movement, which has now become a global movement, was just at its beginning, we understood that our words were not being heard by our society. That in fact, we were being oppressed. We were being, we were being edited out of, of, the, of the political uh, and spiritual uh, discourse that was necessary in our society. I, as a, as a young artist activist, I, I realized, we realized, I should say, those of us who were a handful of people who were doing these things, uh, that we needed to create our own media in order to be able to tell our own stories. <coughs> and so Public Access TV has, was born out of that very need, which we still have, of course, 50 years later, the, the situation has become even more critical in terms of environmental issues, for example. Um, the, my activism has become the act of actually recording events that would never be seen by the public. This gives me a tremendous sense of satisfaction. Um, not only theater events that would never be seen, we at ORCA were able to we're able to broadcast entire theater pieces of Bread and Puppet, for example. Uh, this summer, I was given the privilege of being able to record all of the developmental uh, pieces made by Bread and Puppet, which is um, a, a tremendous voice for freedom and activism in our, in our society. Uh, just this weekend, I actually filmed the encampment of uh, uh, Extinction Rebellion that was right outside the State House. They had many messages. These young people were so brave to be camping out there in this cold and rainy weather for two days. I really admired them so much. Um, so that it took me to make a 12 minute piece, which I put out yesterday, actually required eight hours of work. That, that shows that how, it shows that the recording of these events is not really free. It, it really does take hard work. And so I'm just here to, to say I hope that we will, in these very critical times that we are now faced with, that we need the voice of public access more than ever, more than we've ever needed. The, there is a sense in the witnessing of events in which vulnerability, emotional vulnerability, is permitted to occur. This is a very healthy impulse in society. We, we need not to be invulnerable with incredible military expenditures to, to, uh, to protect our invulnerability. We need to become vulnerable to other cultures, to other people, to, to ancient cultures, to learning from them, to learning from each other. That is how we're going to preserve life on this planet. 
So, I just want to tell you something. I'm trying to give you a message about the innate vitality of what we are doing now um, and how we need it to help our very life process. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy O'Reilly from Town of Colchester. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Kathy O'Reilly. I'm the Director of Economic Development for the Town of Colchester. My job is to advocate and to assist businesses who are in our community, but also those who are looking to relocate into our community. We are fortunate enough to have Lake Champlain Access TV, our community media center, located in Colchester. And knowing that this um, FCC funding and action could hurt them, that is why I'm here. Um, they provide jobs and are value added in our community. They employ our residents, but they also employ residents of our sounding, uh, um, our surrounding communities, excuse me. But I'm also here to talk about how we at the municipality level use them as a resource. They are not just a business to us. They are a resource as well. They provide the public with government access through taped and live productions of government activities, issues, events, and meetings. They provide public access in an open forum and non-commercial informational programming for citizens of all um, groups, organizations, clubs, and enterprises. We've reaped, we, we have reaped we, rewards, wow, I'm having trouble with that, by working with them. They've developed videos for us that help highlight Colchester, our amenities, and our assets. They've done these in multiple languages when we have needed it. Mm -hmm. all, all, they have put it all together for us, found the people to translate, and done everything. They've afforded us much needed drone pictures and videos that we, of course, would not on a municipal budget been able to um, go out and get on our own. They are helping us with the redesign on our website so that we can embed things that the, um, the web uh, design firm would have charged us far too much for, and we couldn't afford that. Um, the community centers also allow for our seniors and homebound people to be a part of our community. They get to watch the government meetings. They get to watch the high school graduations that we've talked about. They get to look at the ro local rotary meetings. Isolation is hard for everybody, especially our elderly. We have long winters here. It keeps everybody engaged. As we know, we have one of the um, oldest demographics, and I think these community media centers are a public good and serve a growing need as we have this aging population. Vermont relies heavily on community media centers, more so than most states, and it's easy to see how they are a vital part of our community fabric, both now and into the future, as public engagement is crucial and a priority for all municipalities. I appreciate the work the committee's doing on trying to identify new funding sources. We need to ensure a stable and sustainable funding source for these community media centers, and that's why the Town of Colchester Select Board signed a resolution in December of 2018 opposing any FCC action that would greatly impact this funding. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. We have about two minutes. So Sorry. I just want to see if anyone has any questions for you or clarifications. Does Colchester make a financial contribution? Yes, Kevin could answer more directly on, on that amount. I, I, I not in that. I use them because I also handle marketing, so I use my marketing budget and make a donation when they do something for us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. I appreciate Thank you. your time. Next up, Donna Giroux from Woodstock. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for doing the hard work that you're doing. I know it is hard work. I am here representing five towns. I am the executive director of um, Community Access Television, CATV. Um, we, it, it's a population of about 48,000 people and 11,000 cabled homes between Comcast and VTEL. And we're also, uh, since many of the community is not cabled, we're also on the internet. 
Uh, we live stream our stations uh, or channels, and we also have a video on demand system. So we try to support the community. And what I wanted to talk to you today about was um, in 2018, there was a sudden um, funding loss due to GAAP, which is the National Accounting Standard for Publicly Held Companies. And um, suddenly, we were down $17,000 out of our budget, and it had a ricochet effect. But before I explain that effect, um, I thought it would be important for you to understand what we're really good at. So besides being a conduit for the community um, to create connections, we're also incredibly good at um, educating our communities. We, we teach 21st century media skills, which are all job-able skills. We um, not only support the five towns that we're responsible for, there's surrounding communities that send their high schoolers and their middle schoolers to us, Bedford, Chelsea, uh, Sharon, <coughs> Tunbridge. These are not supported by public access stations, so we have a, a broader reach. We do one-on-one -on -one adult education. Anyone who walks in our door, we will educate them. We do um, a, we're a feeder. We have middle school camps that are very successful because I get scholarships for everyone through grants. Um, so no kid is left behind. Then we also have them as high school interns, which of course we have to pay because no high schooler will actually intern for us unless, uh, unless there's something lucrative in it. Um, they, we have to turn them into volunteers. They become government videographers. They become volunteer um, videographers. They become editors. Um, all of this takes time and training. Um, an example is one of our students went through our whole program Became, went to, was so inspired, she went to the Hartford, um, what is it, technical high school for the, in the design program. She went off to college, all while working with us, went off to college in Vermont, um, came back every summer, worked in our camps as a counselor, worked part-time, did everything, every job we had, she um, did through high school and college. I had a job waiting for her when she finished college. She became a full-timer, and now, this week, she's sending me a high school intern from the technical high school, because now she teaches the design program at that technical mm -hmm. high school. It is a, it is a classic example of keeping it in Vermont, of education, free education, and um, so to have a funding loss, of course, it's going to affect what we are capable of doing on an education level. So the ricochet is, two years ago, um, we suddenly lost $17,000 out of our budget because of this change of accounting standard. So now we're up to $34,000. And this year when our servers melted down, um, we had anticipated the servers melting because when you're in a nonprofit, you use a piece of equipment until it dies. So now we're $34,000. The server replacement was a $60,000 expense installed. So where do I get the money from? 34 would have come out of the, that funding because we try to we try to save for capital expenses. I'm dying about one minute. It, it comes, it eventually ricochets down to our education program. We know the secret sauce to educate, get those media skills, get those job skills going. We just need the funding to buy the ingredients <coughs> to be able to do that. So I really appreciate that you guys are here and that you're doing what you're doing because I anticipate we're going to have even harder times ahead with the FCC changes. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about the uh, 17,000 and you said 34,000 now? Well, yeah. So in 2018, it was 17,000. And um, when I talked to our cable provider, they said to anticipate the same loss. Um, mm -hmm. from this point forward. And, and so, uh, what cable providers? Uh, I have two with? cable providers, VTEL, but I don't believe that's publicly held. I haven't seen any change in revenue so, and okay. Comcast. So the majority of our business is through Comcast. Okay. And um, uh, th you said it's directly as a result of the accounting changes, right? Right. Exactly. So that's... So that uh, they already took effect, those accounting right. changes? for the last two years. So to just see how a small amount of money can have a great impact, you know, there's the um, public access has very simple budgets, if you think about it, as a company. 
We've always been worked as a utility. So to spend our time trying to transition from a utility business model to a nonprofit business model is very time consuming. Mm -hmm. So to have the services suffer, so you're trying to make sure that none of your services suffer. So the softest service is education and mm -hmm. unfortunately it has the greatest impact on our global economy. Donna, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Judy Paxman, I believe from Swanton. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for letting me be here. So my name is Judy Paxman, and I am the executive director of the Swanton Arts Council. And I'd really like to thank you for taking the time to consider new funding sources for public access television. You've heard so much information and statistics about why it's so important. So I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to tell you a story. And that's a story about a man named Scott. Scott returned to the Swanton area after release from prison following a battle with alcohol and addiction. He was in a dead-end job that he detested and he was trying to rebuild his life when he started attending local arts events. His passion was music, and he began dabbling with writing and art to fill some of the voids that alcohol and drugs had left behind. Scott joined the writers group held at the library, and I think that's where he first heard about Northwest Access um, TV. You really can't be in any public event in Swanton for very long without hearing about Northwest Access TV, um, it could, because it's so embedded in our community we all end up on a video sooner or later. <laughs> and so is Scott. He started off helping to create a promo video on Northwest Access for the Swanton Arts Spectacular, which is an outdoor artisan showcase with live music. Then Scott took part in a small community video project for Northwest Nightmares, and that's an event that is hosted by Northwest Access TV, where he had his acting debut and he had the opportunity to see himself on the big screen at the Weldon Theater in St. Albans. Scott was again filmed performing original music at the Emotion Speaks art show held at our local library. A local reporter interviewed Scott on Northwest Access program to talk about his music, his art, and his path of recovery. And he participated in the great poetry read filled at the library. And this goes on and on and on. During all of these interactions at Northwest Access, Scott's confidence grew, and it was reflected in his attitude, in his music, his writing, and his actions. And he started getting even more involved. He started to help promote local artists in Swanton and St. Albans, and he took the lead in arranging for all the performers for the next year's Swanton Arts Spectacular. And he was instrumental in establishing free concerts <coughs> in the newly formed Swanton Soundstage. Scott started to be seen not as a recovering alcoholic, but as a local celebrity, and a passionate supporter of the arts in our community. And Northwest Access not only played a vital role in his transformation, they documented his journey along the way in a positive and supportive environment. Scott now hosts a, public, a monthly public ac access show dedicated to the arts in Swanton and has been nominated to the Board of Directors for the Swanton Arts Council. He is pursuing his music as his primary source of income and he's in the process of recording his first album. And that's just Scott's story. Just one person impacted by public access television who makes up one of the statistics you've heard today. I could really list a dozen more. I, I could, like, Len, like Emmett, who's, when he was 19, he won a Writer's Award, and he was interviewed on a local, by a local reporter at Northwest Access TV. Soon, with their help, he was creating his own videos, doing his own directing, filming, and editing. And that reporter who interviewed him and Emmett he are Emma and Scott. He's also a Northwest Access regular now, and he's taking part in community videos, creating his own, developing his passion for acting and editing and directing. I could talk about Heather, who started as a part-time videographer, and um, she has now made it her personal mission to create independent spotlights on local Swanton businesses and wants to get them all. She's doing that on her own time. She's also accepted an appointment to the Planning and Zoning Board. So Judy, about one minute. Okay, great. Uh, we could talk about Nicole, who's gone from camera phobic to now being part of a video, um, a local community video. And I'll end with Kinley, who participated in her first Swanton community video at age four. 
Now at six, she starred in three community videos, and she has a solid connection now to the community that will last her entire life. Each statistic that you hear today is made up of individuals who are gaining confidence, experience, and another connection to their community because of public access television. This service is so vitally important to our local government, our community, and our nonprofit organizations, but the impact it has on each individual is priceless. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. <coughs> Jamie Riley from Sunderland? Tammy. 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 Oh, I apologize. No worries. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tammy Riley. I'm the executive director at uh, Greater Northshire Access Television, also known as GNAT TV. And we serve 11 towns in the Manchester region, southwest, southwestern Vermont. Our service area population is about 15,000 people, and our cable channels reach 6,000 plus homes. Um, many years ago, we re recognized that we need to offer programs and services that are relevant to people's 21st century lives. So we built up our government coverage, we launched new youth education and training programs, and we acknowledged that our information needs of our local communities were not being met by commercial television. We do have access to commercial television in Albany, New York, in Burlington, Vermont, but the coverage of issues that affect southwestern Vermont are negligible, and frankly, the coverage exists when something terrible happens. So that's what we've seen in our community. So to address the News and Information Desert, we launched the news project in 2016, and I want to talk about that a little bit, and then talk about how our organization is navigating the um, current climate. Um, the news project is a mechanism to provide <coughs> pertinent local information to the people in our 11 distinct communities. Since 2016, GNET TV has produced 716 pieces of local news content. And while the cable provider does not provide us with viewer data, we are able to capture online statistics. We saw a 56% increase in video views online between 2016 and 2017. And between 2017 and 2018, we saw a 176% increase in online consumption of our material. The increase in the online community engagement reflects both the relevance of the information offered by the News Project and our ability to leverage those online distribution platforms. Um, so like all of our colleagues around the state that have talked about this, we, we play a vital role in providing cultural coverage, historical coverage, and, and local issues that really impact the daily lives of our citizens. Mm -hmm. We partner with organizations in our communities, the historical societies, libraries, and schools. Uh, several years ago, we also recognized that the cable industry is evolving, the regulatory structure may change, and we began thinking strategically about development and fundraising. And we embarked on changing the culture of our organization to support development and fundraising efforts. We built a modest list of donors and underwriters, and each town meeting day, we asked the town's voters for a small appropriation of $2,000 to help offset the cost of our government coverage. In light of the recent events, the uh, slight loss of subscribers, the FCC ruling, and the gap accounting changes, we're exploring all options to sustain our future. We're making many operational changes to address the sh funding shortfalls, and we continue to develop our fundraising plans for the future. Unfortunately, after offering services free of charge for nearly 25 years, we're compelled to charge fees to our constituents for many of our services. We're reviewing our policies, we're developing fee-for-service programs for our schools and our nonprofit organizations, and we've instituted modest fees for our training programs. We've held off on purchasing new technology, and our staff will not receive the cost of living increases. Despite all of these strategies, 92% of our funding is still derived from the cable subscribers. These austerity measures and modest revenue generating strategies won't be enough to sustain the organization. Our organizational capacity is challenged as we try to build out a fundraising and development structure. Experienced fundraisers know you need focus and you need staff to be successful. So the endeavors to build out our development capacity may come at the cost of delivering the programs for our community, and this needs to be recognized. So um, tell me about one minute. Sure, thank you. Um, in closing, as the regulatory structures change and market transformations force our sector to define our value and our relevance, 
It also provides us an opportunity to be resilient and innovative, and I'm hopeful that the legislature will find a solution to support community media and the needs of Vermonters by requiring communications providers to contribute to the public good for the use of the rights of way. Community media is a public asset worth protecting, and it's vital to the people of Vermont. Thank you for your work. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Steve Whitaker from Montpelier. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We labor the value of public access. I'd like to speak to some of the proposed solutions. Mm -hmm. um, I'll call your attention to a document that uh, I just received. The state members of the state and federal board on universal service funds um, got tired of being stalled by the federal members at the FCC, so they finally just put out their proposed decision. Uh, the state members uh, clearly articulate the rationale and a defensible strategy for charging all users of the right-of-way. Actually, they mention all communications users, but Charles Larkin, who couldn't be here today, and I have been proposing that all users of the right-of-way, be they including electric, and in some cases gas, buried gas pipelines, where it's in the public right-of-way, could all, all users of the public right-of-way could contribute to a fund to support the public good. I think it's important that this committee consider recommending legislation that defines the public good. It's too vague of a concept and it's used uh, erratically. And uh, it's important for the Public Utilities Commission to have its feet held to the fire to uh, defend what a public good is. Uh, according to a statutory standard. Um, reviving Vermont Interactive Television, what I call next generation DIT, uh, was recommended by the PUC years ago as a public engagement, uh, public hearing medium. And there are quite a few agencies in state government that are supposed to be engaging with the public in budget, draft budget development through the finance office, et cetera. They don't have that tool. The League of Cities and Towns could do more effective training with Vermont Interactive Television. That's a logical fit with the public access stations to support the creation of VIT in co-located and fiber connected with these public access stations. They were, VIT was generating hundreds of thousands in revenue using the old outdated and expensive technology. New technology is much less expensive to operate equipment wise it's more expensive connectivity wise so establishing gigabit or 10 gigabit circuits to all the AMOs should be a top priority both for to support the statewide AMO creation uh, and to support file sharing and archiving among the AMOs um, you've got two minutes okay. sure um, I believe the governance, the opportunity here, when we start talking about putting state funding from the a universal service fund type model into public access media, it's going to necessitate a, uni a uniform governance and standards. I'd encourage you to think about the role that the access media organizations could play in emergency uh, planning and management. Uh, we need to have community information centers stay live to inform the public and for people to know where they could go and there's a generator, they could charge their cell phone, they could get the latest news on what needs to happen. It's possible that with some resiliency rules written and enforced by the PUC, Comcast could re be required to, or the cable companies could be required to just re reconfigure their networks so that they could be kept alive by generators where they're fiber. Uh, so where they are connected by fiber. The pole mounted amplifiers are a recurring issue. Uh, 
they interrupt voice voice service and leave dead zones when the power outage is are extended. Other About topic. 45 seconds, just so you know. I'll stop and let you ask any questions. I don't want you to feel cut off. I just wanted you to be able oh, to. Oh, yeah. I feel cut off regularly. <laughs> So I'm going to ask a quick question. Uh, you were talking about uh, the Vaughn Interactive Television. Are you suggesting that the uh, public, uh, the PEG TV, uh, PEG Access TV stations uh, provide the Vaughn Interactive Television-like services? Yes. Okay. Funded by the state as, as a income-producing center, recognizing and regulated. I mean, they need to be available. There needs, if the legislature needs it for a statewide hearing, that has to preempt something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Angelica Condes from Richmond. Hi. So I'm Angelica Condes. Um, and I'm the director of Mount Mansfield Community Television, and I'm going to do course style to get through this uh, in time, um, which has served Jericho, Underhill, and Richmond since 1997. So I'd like to underline the threat to Vermont's collective local memory if PEG funding were to decline. A lot of the work we do today is not just about today, but about preserving video archives for tomorrow. We build our town's vaults of stories each day, whether our staff fall in tears, or staff um, film a public meeting, high school graduation, town meeting day, or smaller moments, such as interviews with artists at open studio, or residents rebuilding after a flood. So in a time when local press is getting thinner, non-commercial community media centers like ourselves are embedded in our communities and devoted to shepherding a wealth of hyper-local stories into the future. So I'd like to give you an example of a program that captures local stories that would be imperiled by a funding drop our Memory Map Road History video series. So in 2012, MMCTV received a grant from the Vermont Community Foundation to create a paid internship where young filmmakers, aged 12 to 21, would make videos about local road histories. So since then, and long after the grant ran out, um, youth from our three towns have made eight videos. So eight. Um, for each short documentary, they pick a road, research its history, interview people, film the road as it is today and find photos. Just in one small example, um, Jericho farmer Dean Davis um, <coughs> resolved a local mystery, revealing how Raceway Road got its name. He recalled his mother and aunt talking about Sunday horse races, and that was long before his time or ours. So at MMCTV, we worry that gems like this that add to our community's knowledge of ourselves would be lost with a major cable revenue drop. So last year, and this is echoing some of my colleagues' statements, um, but just to give you a sense that this is happening in many towns, we turned to our municipalities for the first time for discretionary funds, and they were able to cover more than half of, a, of our $13,000 shortfall in our estimated 2018 budget. Um, and today our small staff is spending less time on videos and more time on fundraising from more paid summer TV camps from young people, which we actually learned the model from CATV, um, to encouraging a local brewery to make a special edition peg beer. Um, we are hoping to, as a survival strategy, to maybe move into one of our municipal buildings soon. Um, so these efforts have resulted in about 10% of our current $155,000 budget being made up of non-cable revenue this year. Over the next two to five years, maybe we could find 30 or even 50% of our total budget locally. It's hard, however, to envision finding more money around town, our three towns, um, while still maintaining our <coughs> own focus and mission, what we're there to do. Um, so concern about future funding drops is already making us kind of think twice and being less um, embracing of people when they come to us. They're like, can you film this? Can you film that? Um, or putting resources in what we call our extra projects things that are special and made in HD and really pretty. Mm -hmm. um, so my hope is that this community will keep the important work that PEG centers are doing every day in building and preserving and making accessible Vermont's collective memory um, as it takes the time as you do the work to um, help us do our work for years to come. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You were so efficient. We have a minute and 30 seconds left. <laughs> I don't know if there are questions. I have a question in terms of you're saying 
Um, now that you have to spend more time on fundraising, you have less time essentially for, for doing the work of programming. And so can you just give us an example of what that, that looks like? Um, last year, I, pro I promised somebody who had made a garden tour video series that it would be done at the end of the summer. And because of summer camps and this and that, we saw some of the first garden tour videos come onto the screen like when there was snow on the ground. Uh, which, was which is lovely uplifting. in some ways, but <laughs> not necessarily appropriate. <laughs> yes. Okay. So there's a turnaround time that's slower because our staff is basically myself full time and two other people part time and hire field producers and volunteers. Is that because you're, you're, you're having uh, less hours that you're getting paid for, or is it because you have to do more fundraising efforts? Um, our hours have stayed the same, and we've actually mm -hmm. continued with our 3% annual increase for our staff. Um, but um, yeah, there's just the time that you devote to making that poster or encouraging the brewer to do this or that with the, you know, getting local beer out that you're not spending, you know, researching new cameras or finding a way to fix that live stream. Thank you. So we have one more witness who has signed up, though I'm looking at the time, and we do have time if there are other folks in the room who came and weren't sure if they wanted to testify and now are interested. If that is you, please come see uh, the committee assistant, Peggy, and we can get your name and where you're from and hear from you before we, we run out of time. So next up is Hannah Dennison from Washington. Thank you for coming. Yeah, Washington, Vermont. Washington, Vermont, not Washington <laughs> County. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm so Washington, D.C. Exactly. No. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Um, I am a dance artist of 40 years in this state and uh, came upon um, my public assets channel at the time I was living in Burlington and it was RETF and I was, as most artists, trying to make it on a little thin thread and I was working with a videographer who had recently graduated from high school. And he was really good behind the camera, did really great work, but he could not wake up in the morning. He put his phone right by his head. He put, you know, it was just like, and I was waiting for him at RETN to have him help me edit. So consequently, I learned how to edit. <laughs> but my relationship started with uh, the community access channel there, and it was extremely fruitful and I don't know what I would do without them. My work is regularly on their uh, cycle and I have uh, borrowed equipment and we have spent a great deal of time in the editing studio going through all the footage in order then to send it down to the person in Brooklyn who charges me, you know, a fair amount of money but we're chipping away at what it will cost by the work that we do in the access station. Um, I'm the executive director of Cradle to Grave Arts, which is a long-standing nonprofit here in this state. And um, there are a lot of people who come to see my work. I mostly do work out in unorthodox spaces. And currently, right now, I'm working in the flooded quarry in Websterville and uh, creating a piece there that will be public in next summer. And uh, this summer, the uh, crew at the Media Factory brought their new VR camera to the quarry to get footage and um, used it uh, for their own you know, so look at what we have. Here's a piece of equipment. Let's, you know, this is one way to look at it and use it. And um, they have been uh, my media partner for I don't know how long, really long time. And I, I don't know what I would do without them because, quite frankly, <clears throat> the commercial television and the public television, they aren't. They're not interested in this. So they're vital to my part of the, you know, the conversation as an artist. So I thank you for your work you're doing to move this along and make sure that we continue to get funding for this. Yeah, any questions? 
Anna, you talked about mm. your um, my necessity needing to learn how to edit. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more about that. Oh, well, um, uh, yeah, I don't know that I can tell you very much more, except that I, ha I was doing a year-long project mm -hmm. on the waterfront in Burlington. And so every month we were out there, and every month I had footage to go through yeah. and then put up on the channel. And so um, I just, I had to learn. And um, I have not necessarily kept that up because it's not what I want to spend my time doing. Sure. Just like fundraising is not what I want to spend my time doing. But I have to. Right. So I, I, but I have worked um, with the folks at Public Access, and they helped me. You know, they sort of stood right next to mm -hmm. me and helped me to learn how to yeah. do all of that electronic stuff. Great. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So is there anyone in the audience today who uh, is moved to testify? Because we do have some more time. OK. I want to thank, oh, did you see somebody? Was somebody? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I True. Come on up. I didn't yeah. see you back there. Right. Let us know who you are and where you're from. Uh, my name is Dick Fodal from Middlebury. Um, I retired two years ago as executive director of Middlebury Community Television. Can you spell your last name? Uh, T-H-O-D-A-L. And um, listening to all of this testimony brings back a flood of memories. And uh, there, I just wanted to bring up one that uh, I remember from a conversation that we had in Bennington, maybe in the, sometime in the early 90s. I think you may have been there. Then. But um, at the time, uh, we, were, we were just moving out of three-quarter inch tape and, and starting to use VHF, VHS. And, um, and the internet was just something that was just vaguely out there. But um, we, there were, we had an idea that all of this was going to evolve. And I remember asking a question, what would be the purpose of PEG access if in the future everybody had a camcorder or some mm. sort of a camera mm. and that there was a way for everybody to, uh, mm. to get their information online? And, and I think it was uh, John Donovan from Cambridge Community Television. Does that, does that sound right? Mm -hmm. And he said, it's important for us to be aggregators mm -hmm. in the community. And uh, that, is, that stuck with me you know, from that time forward. And uh, so throughout the whole time that I was director at MCTV, um, I felt that, that aggregating local content was, was really what we were there to do. It's so. an excellent point. Good uh, questions. Well, you've thought a lot about how voice, data, and video run on the same lines, mm -hmm. same rights of way, different regulation. And you've talked a lot about the importance of rationalizing that policy. Do you want to say anything about that today? Well, are you leading the witness, Lauren? I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I, I was going to say she missed her calling. <laughs> that was, it's an excellent question, and I, I would love to hear your thoughts on well, that. Well, uh, ever, ever since the beginning, you know, I've been acutely aware of, of bandwidth mm -hmm. and, and what that all means. And there uh, are a number of, I could get way out in the weeds on it. Uh, I think Steve Whitaker. You know, probably summed it up in saying that that, that all the peg access channels ought to have, um, you know, at least gigabit Ethernet, and uh, that hope would open up so much more. As as it is, uh, uh, like at MCTV, we were still stuck with old uh, modulators and analog and analog transmission that goes way back <coughs> to the seventies, mm -hmm. and I think. It really, you know, I felt the whole time that it'll just be another couple of years before we'll be up to state of the art, but uh, that never happened. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Great to see you. Jeff, can I make 
one more point. Uh, that I so, Steve, if you'll come sure. up, right. I will, since we do have time, I'll give you another minute to make your... Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I ran out of time. Uh, yeah. It's important to frame this work of this committee, the work of the Access Media Organizations, in the overall flux of technology governance. Uh, you're all well aware of our difficulties in achieving a coherent and comprehensive telecommunications plan. Back in the 90s, it was the public access stations involved, or public access uh, leaders involved in the docket over the Vermont Telecommunications Agreement contract, where we discovered that the first telecom plan had not been written. We're in a similar moment now, and it's the public access stations that are on the ground, know who needs the what type of technology, who can provide the meaningful input into creating a real telecom plan. Um, that I think that we should not, with the urgency, not having had a duly adopted plan since 04, we're 15 years behind with a comprehensive telecom plan. And it's important that we get it done right this time, and that will necessarily provide another opportunity for the state to provide some financial support uh, to coordinate these workshops, teach people how to provide meaningful input into the telecom plan. <coughs> Thank, Thank you. So I don't want to beat a dead horse. However, as an extrovert, I'm always aware that there are introverts in the room that just need a little bit more time to decide they want to testify. My wife always reminds me of this. She says, just because you feel comfortable talking off the cuff, not everyone does. So. I just want to make sure if there's someone who came today that feels like they do want to speak, that they know they have the opportunity to, you do not need to take all five minutes, but if there's something that you need us to know, please feel free. And certainly, if you don't feel like talking, though, you can always submit your comments uh, to the, the committee, um, which you can receive them electronically. And I would like to point out that we have received quite a number of uh, electronically submitted comments already, so they will go on record. <clears throat> so logistically, um, shortly we'll, we'll wrap up, and then as a committee, we're going to reconvene at 1, and our meetings are all open to the public if you want um, to sit in and listen to our, our conversation. I do want to thank everyone for coming, and I want to take the opportunity to thank all the folks who have volunteered their time on this work group. It is, um, it, we do it because we love the work that we do. We are not getting compensated for this work, um, except that we heard today all the reasons why PEG access is so vital. And I just want to go through some of the things that folks mentioned today. It is about government. It's about art. It's about educating our local community members. It's about bringing together community. Uh, someone talked about allowing people not just to think their own ideas, to think their own thoughts, but have those conveyed out to the public. It's about news, local and statewide. It's about giving people technical expertise. It's about training students. In short, it is about us. It's about who we are as Vermonters. And that is why we give our time to this committee. So again, thank you so much for coming today. Committee, feel free to um, take a lunch break and then we'll reconvene at one. I see someone else in the audience that would like to say something. I have a brief question, which yes. is for any of us who are present who have further thoughts on the basis of what we've heard in this hearing, is there a mechanism for us to provide further written comment beyond what we gave today? Absolutely. So Mike? Ferrant, who is our committee assistant, uh, Peg is, Peggy is substituting today, but his email address is on the web page for this committee, and you should absolutely feel free to submit any testimony electronically that you want to submit to uh, add more um, detail, perhaps to your testimony or to somebody else's. So. And then did you just want to say what the outcome of this committee is and why this testimony is valuable to us? Right, so the charge for the committee is to put forward a bill or bills in the upcoming um, legislative session that will address this issue of long-term 
uh, funding and sustainability for these channels. Now, it could be that what will come out of that will be a recommendation for further research, that we don't have enough to, to charge the legislature with coming up with a plan um, in the upcoming session. That is what we're going to be talking about for the next two meetings as a group to figure out what do we have, what do we have the runway to get done before the end of our time, and what can we charge our colleagues with. And as my vice chair reminded me of this morning, anything that we put forward, of course, goes through the committee process in both the House and the Senate. And so, which is a wonderful thing because all these other people get to weigh in on the plan and they get to hear from their constituents as well. So whatever that we're putting forward is really just a concept or idea that will be vetted by many people going forward. Thank you. So, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Have a nice day, everybody. Thank you.